Hey, Facebookers, hello, Hi. podcast listeners. Welcome to Health Hackers episode 13. I'm Gemma Evans. I'm a journalist here in the UK, and this is my series devoted to meeting some of the most pioneering figures in health and wellness right now. And my guest sitting next to me today is Angelique Panagos. She is a nutrition and hormone expert. She's with us for the next 30 minutes answering your questions. We're talking about eating for hormonal health because Angelique has written this book. Exciting. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, it is back to front. That's because the camera's in selfie mode. But it's the balance plan, six steps to optimize your hormonal health. So as I said, we've got Angelique with us for the next 30 minutes. Pop your questions in the comment section on Facebook. And I'm gonna be looking down here a lot because I'm gonna be keeping an eye on the feed, seeing what you're saying, and we can put all your comments to Angelique. But let's begin yeah. by kind of uncovering what it is that, that makes clear you have a hormonal problem. Like what are the signs? Mm. How do we know that our hormones are out of whack basically? There are so many different signs and I like to think of them as these niggly little symptoms that we may not actually recognize as, um, as the signs. And I feel that this hormonal, I call it hormonal dis-ease, is just increasing, plus we're talking about it a lot more, so we're, we're creating a lot more awareness around it. But the, um, the common ones that we may um, experience are irregular periods, um, hot flushes, uh, insomnia, uh, but other things like constipation, irritability, mood swings, belly flat, flat? Belly belly fat, fat. around the middle that you can't shift, um, cold hands and feet, hair falling out, gritty eyes or another one as well. So um, if you're experiencing any of those type of things, then they just don't seem to go away. They, they just seem to be there in the background all the mm. time and they're just these niggly little symptoms. Then it is an indication that maybe you need to do some investigation and see what's going on. Because sometimes I feel like a lot of those symptoms apply to a lot of us, but we just sort of see them as white noise and we mm. just put up with it because mm. we think, oh, this is what ev everyone must feel this mm. rough every day. Um, so that's really interesting, but then sometimes it can get a bit more serious. So what are the conditions mm. that are the, the key conditions like PCOS? Yeah. So polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, endometriosis, um, hypothyroidism as well, and Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune condition which attacks the thyroid and then can leave us with overactive or underactive thyroid. Um, and as well as, you know, can lead down to difficulty in conception, so fertility issues, um, fibroids, and also cysts in the breasts, the really painful cystic breasts as yeah. well can um, be an indication. And I think we, when we think about hormones, we, we, we might only just think about our reproductive system and yeah. the sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone. And sometimes we don't even think of testosterone as women as well, yeah, yeah. but it definitely plays a big role in our hormonal dance. I like to think of hormones as this beautiful Viennese waltz, you know, it's, oh, everything is in balance, everything is beautiful, but we're doing the hokey pokey and we're using the wrong feed and we're just all over the place. And you know, I've, I've had many hormonal conditions myself and I totally get it and exactly what you said it was just this white noise I just thought this is normal it's normal not to menstruate it's normal to be grumpy it's normal to have PMS like someone is attacking you and therefore you're attacking others mm. um, but it's not normal that's not how we should be one of the things I really liked about your book when I was reading it is how much detail you go into about your personal story mm. would you feel comfortable sharing a bit of that absolutely here? absolutely and I the reason why I share it and, and so willingly and openly as well is because when I was going through hormonal conditions I felt really alone I felt like it was only me <clears throat> I was the only one that was dreading my period I was the only one that was having <clears throat> I'm so sorry these sorry. extended periods of time between periods up to 90 days um, and I really felt alone and that's why I really want to share what yeah. I was going through and so I'm the girl that started her periods at 10 years old so that's really young. You know, I was so young I thought I'd pooped out of my front bum. It was just, it was a horrible affair from the beginning with terrible period cramps and they just never regulated. And I felt that I was just kept putting on weight as well. So I was always on some form of a diet. Yeah. Um, I've tried every single because diet. Because you think that's the only way, like, oh, I better go do this diet. It's exactly. all about cutting calories, like that's going to solve everything. That was, I was the queen of calorie counting absolute queen it was diet everything low-fat everything and um, or unfortunately I went down a slippery slope of eating disorders as well really? so then it was eating nothing 
or purging or binge eating. And then that would have had a knock-on effect on your periods too, I imagine. Absolutely. So then they became non-existent. So I went into amenorrhea. And that's when I, um, I got to a point where I thought, I can't feel like this. This, this can't be how one is meant to feel. And that's when I got into nutrition and studied nutritional therapy. Mm -hmm. And that's when I actually worked out that not menstruating for 90 days at a time is not normal. Mm -hmm. Feeling like this is not normal. And I did further investigations and I was really lucky that I had a doctor that went deep, like we went deep into bloods and scans and everything. And I was diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome <clears throat> and Hashimoto's which is the autoimmune condition which attacked my thyroid and left me with hyperthyroidism. Yeah. That's really tough. I can really relate. I too have, have been told I've got polycystic ovaries mm -hmm. and um, I've had bouts of secondary amenorrhea for probably my entire adult life. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what your thoughts are on the kind of help available mm -hmm. because when I went to see specialists, and I've seen so many specialists, endocrinologists, gynecologists, bioidentical hormones experts, two nutritionists, I, I didn't really know what I, what I was looking for. I was looking mm. for answers, but I felt like everybody was trying to find their own way of helping me, but there was never really a typical answer. And I didn't know whether that's because there's a, a lack of knowledge, like there's still maybe lots we don't know and medical professionals don't know about our bodies or whether it's because I was just a really difficult case. Mm. <clears throat> so it's interesting you say that because um, we are still learning. This is the beauty about science is that it's forever evolving, we're forever learning, and um, it's really an exciting time because I feel like we're talking about it more yeah. as well. And that in turn gets practitioners and doctors and everyone even more into the literature to see what's going on. But we are all biochemically individual. And even if you may fit into a polycystic ovary box or an endometriosis box, we're still individual and therefore it's not a one-size-fits-all approach and it's about looking at it from a functional model so really looking at what's the underlying causes mm -hmm. and with things like amenorrhea for example we really need to look at stress management as well as gut function and um, we need to look at the bloods and we need to look at you as a person with your symptoms mm. and put that whole picture together to try I think and a lot out. of people underestimate what an effect stress can have on the body I keep I'm, I'm, it's like I have this massive drum and I'm just beating this drum about well, say, um, stress and sugar and low fat. The, these are the drums that I'm beating continuously because stress, the message of stress, its job is to override other messages in the body. That is its job. Its job is to say, there's a wild animal about to eat you. You need to turn around and run. You don't need to be digesting. You don't need to be reproducing. You need to be just getting out of danger's way. And of course, that's an extremely simple way of putting this it. This is like back to when we were cavemen and women. Back to cavemen. Yeah. But now we still, like stress is still there in that acute reaction. We step in front of a car. The car beeps at us. We step back. We amount an immune response. Uh, not an immune response. Sorry, a stress, stress response yeah. to get us out of danger's way. However... We're living in this chronic stressed state at the moment. Mm. Many of us are chronically stressed. We stress from work, deadlines, um, just so many things going on. And I feel as women, we're these professional plate spinners and we, you know, we're mm -hmm. the gatekeepers. We have to take care of ourselves, our family, our friends, our work. We just take on a lot. So that's one stress. But another stress is lack of sleep. Yeah. And that's modern world at the moment. We're going to bed with our iPhones instead of our partners and we that we don't know what effect, or we're understanding now more and more what effect that blue light is having on I'm us. getting really good at putting my phone into night shift mode from like 8 o'clock in the yeah, evening. I'd really, I'd really recommend that and, and having a curfew. and It's difficult. Yeah. I'm the same. Like last night I was on there because of the football. Mm. And I was on there a lot trying to, I was trying to get off of that. But when I went to bed, my brain was still busy. And that's yeah. another thing. We've got really busy brains at the moment and everything's just Constantly whizzing around. Thinking. So, but stress... Just on that point, stress mm. has a major effect on our hormones and it affects our reproductive hormones and it affects our, our sex hormones and it affects our thyroid hormone and um, it affects your ability to retain new information and, um, and our happiness, really, uh, Yeah, it? absolutely. Um, Facebookers, if you've just joined us, I'm with nutrition and hormone expert Angelique Panagos. She wrote this, The Balance Plan. We're talking about eating for hormonal health. We can discuss fertility, the contraceptive pill, endometriosis. Anything you like, put your questions in the comments section below and I'll put them to Angelique. Um, what are the biggest mistakes in terms of diet mm -hmm. that we can make that create hormonal havoc? Mm -hmm. like, where are we going wrong? I'd say, like, I think we need to first like, not see food as good and bad. I think that's this whole diet culture, 
has led to hormonal disorders as, as from what I have seen and from my understanding the two biggest issues was this whole um, social experiment that we were all signed up to and that was remove the fat and add in some yeah, sugar. Yeah, so like I've been raised just watching TV and, and all other kind of sources of material to be told that low fat is how you should mm. eat. So why we used to buy low fat margarine, mayonnaise, yogurt, everything and now it's being turned on its head and we know that fat is, is good. I mean how good is real fat for us? So if we're looking at the starting blocks of hormonal health then we're looking at fat. And we're looking at LDL cholesterol, which is bad cholesterol, mm. and we're looking at other triglycerides, and they actually form that starting point. So if you're not having enough fat in your diet, you have a rate-limiting step right there. Because that fat gets converted down into something called pregnenolone, and then into progesterone, cortisol, DHEA, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, so everything. So if we're not having enough fats, but if, I can't stress this enough as well, it's everything in balance. So it's not mm -hmm. too much of just one thing. And then sugar, you know, bringing in all this refined sugar and, you know, these um, sugar syrups and these um, corn syrups and fructose syrups and all and of that. And a lot of juices, juices. just concentrated sugar, really. Because a lot of people think, oh, oh, fruit, it's really healthy fruit juice, but it's still perceived as sugar by our body, isn't it? So when we're looking at fruit, I love talking about fruit and sugar because I think we've just lumped everything into one category and that's caused a lot of confusion. If we eat apple as nature intended it, an apple... It's got a whole host of different things. It's got fiber, it's got nutrients, and it's got the fructose. But if we take 40 apples and we juice them into this concentrate, what we're left with there is no fiber. And what we're left with there is a high, is a lot of fructose. And um, what happens with fructose is it actually gets taken through the liver and converted to triglycerides, and then that becomes energy after that. But when we're taking in these extrinsic sugars, mm. so these refined um, syrups into the diet, these are having a knock-on effect and an impact on our health. So let's talk about some questions mm. from viewers now. Thank you Facebookers for putting these down. Um, we can't give out any specific medical advice, but we can talk in general terms, because obviously all medical issues are between you and your doctor. So let's have a look at Christina's questions. So mm. she um, she's taking thyroid medication, but she's also trying to conceive, and she wants to know um, how can she eat to support her thyroid function mm -hmm. as much as possible so that it would be able to support a healthy pregnancy. So how would you typically advise someone to support their thyroid if they're trying for a baby? I'd say that thyroid health is essential and um, you know it's our master metabolism, It's I call it the queen of metabolism and um, we can really support the thyroid in a lot of different ways. And uh, the one is to reduce stress. Stress has a major impact on thyroid health so it's not only just about food when we're looking at thyroid. Um, actually, when we're looking at hormones in general, it's not just about food, it's about lifestyle as well. So reduction of stress, looking at your gut health is another really important thing. Yeah, yeah, that's another area that's fascinating, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because I know in the book you talk about fermented foods, the mm -hmm. probiotics, because we're trying to bring in lots of good bugs yeah. to crowd out the bad bugs, am I right? Yeah. And I call them my eco-warriors, and these are the, the good bacteria in the gut, and they're there for your immune system, they're there to fluff out your stool, because Pooping is really important for hormonal function as well because you want to eliminate the toxins. And yeah, there, there's a poo chart mm -hmm. in the book, by the way, so you can tell whether you're healthy or not. I was like, please, can I have a poo chart? <laughs> um, and so with, with the thyroid as well, it's really sensitive to um, to toxins and you know what we call your your xenobiotics. So looking at plastics, is, it's yes. redu reduction of plastics, not using plastics in the microwave, it's not heating with plastic. You know, I was in the gym and I asked for a metal spoon to, with, to have with my drink and the woman behind the counter was like, why can't you just have a plastic one? And I really didn't want to go into it, mm. but I was thinking of all the xenoestrogens and it affecting my body in, in, or my endocrine system in negative ways and I felt like, shall I begin explaining this? And then I realized, why, why don't we all know about this stuff? I mean, yeah. the research is there, isn't it? That these kind of plastics are harmful for us and not friendly to the environment. Exactly. I think that's the message that's going to get it out there quicker, is that it's not, it's, it's not doing our environment any mm. favors. And we're still, we're still getting the message of plastic and what it's doing for the hormones and your hormonal function out there at the moment. So I don't think everyone is aware of it. And, and that's okay, because we're all still learning together. Yeah, yeah. But I would say even things like candles and room scented candles. Yeah, I stopped those, and I don't wear perfume anymore because yeah. it just even feels like I'm spraying chemicals on. You can use a um, a uh, aromatherapy oils. 
-hmm. There's really those nice oils that you can get. You can use that as perfume if you want to smoke, yeah. have a, a bit of a scent. There's one thing in the book I really like as well where you talk about how natural mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's great for you because any, any company could write natural yeah. on their products. It's not regulated, so if it's as natural fragrance, then that is not regulated. So when I climb into a cab and, and, and oh, yeah. I use too many of those, but when and they have an air freshener yeah. on. I often ask them if they can either switch it off or put it in the cubby hole because I'll get a headache. Oh yeah, I'm so sensitive. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's not just me. Um, I'd rather smell other smells than smell that. <laughs> um, so, but that's another thing. And then also looking at the building blocks. So, um, I like to think about the nutrients that we eat as Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the latest craze. Everyone's mm -hmm. tra trading in it, but no one's actually seen Bitcoin. And that's yeah. what nutrients are like from the food that we eat. So we eat the food, it's broken down into what I call this Bitcoin, and then we start trading mm -hmm. in our body. And um, what's really important for thyroid function is protein as well, because it's a peptide hormone, um, which is a protein hormone as well as fat. But also looking at the nutrients that it needs, like iodine and selenium, and um, vitamin A and vitamin D. So really just bringing in a really whole food diet that you're getting all these different nutrients in to support the thyroid. So, so Christina could go and see a nutritionist if she wanted yeah. extra help. I but think people yes. like her trying to get pregnant mm. with a thyroid issue, it's all about stress, environmental toxins, mm. and keeping the protein, good sources of protein. Okay, thank you for your question, Christina. You. Uh, Rich wants to know, uh, he wants to get your thoughts on how we can reduce food cravings. Mm. So you are uh, speaking to the queen of food cravings. I used to feel like I was Garfield. I just wanted to stop my face in a bowl of lasagna. You. Before I gave up sugar, I was oh a complete God, sugar addict. Oh my so bad. And I'd like, I remember phoning my mum and saying, I've got empty wrappers in my hand, so I must have eaten them. But like, when did I make that really? decision? Like, I was just, I was on autopilot. And you know, it's something that my sister and I discuss quite often is that if you have a piece of cake you know exactly how much sugar is in that cake or mm. well, you don't know how much sugar but you're aware that there's yeah, sugar yeah. in it but if you're eating a lot of processed and packaged foods then we don't know how much sugar we're getting in and unfortunately the more we have the more we crave and if we don't have what we call regulated blood sugar levels then we can also have these cravings mm. but if your craving in particular is chocolate so if I were to say to you if I were to give you a block of or a, a lump of sugar would that cut your craving and a lot of the time it's like no, it has to be chocolate. Then we need to look at maybe you need some magnesium. Mm. So try having more dark green leafy vegetables, more nuts and seeds to see if that helps with cravings. It's interesting because Angela has asked what's a good replacement for chocolate. Yeah. So Angela, green leafy veg. Now that does not sound great. So <laughs> let's see what else we can do because you know, we've got to keep living. So I like to think of it as the, the reality, 80 20. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is modern life and uh, we need to fit in with that. So what you can do is maybe add some cinnamon. Okay. So you can add some cinnamon to your breakfast or you can make a cinnamon tea. Um, I know there's a great one that I like by Pucker, which is oh, yeah. cinnamon and licorice. Nice. And then I find that really helps to cut cravings. And then look at what you've been eating before. Make sure you've got enough protein and fat in your meals mm. so that it doesn't lead to cravings. But if you do feel like cravings, because let, well, you do feel like chocolate, let's face it, sometimes you mm. just feel like a chocolate. That's okay. Try and go for 80% and up. Try and choose the best quality chocolate. And if you do feel like the, the milky chocolates of the world, then keep that to the 20%. Okay, good advice. Um, and I guess you've just got to be strong, Angela and Rich, as well. Uh, Rosie says, what's a good diet to follow when recovering after childbirth mm. if you're breastfeeding? Mm, this is a great one. So I am, I am 17 months postpartum, and I didn't realize that I was going to be the mum that counts in months. So my little one's almost a year and a half. And um, her little one is gorgeous. If you yeah. follow follow on Instagram, she's so cute. Oh. <laughs> but I'm also breastfeeding still. So, um, and I'm on a mission now to help mums postpartum feel better because I tell you what, no one prepared me for the exhaustion and the cravings that were going to come with it as well. So we get exhausted postpartum. You know, we've got a little one. We're up at night and we're breastfeeding, which uses a lot of energy. And what happens then is we start seeking out foods that are going to give us a lot of energy. So we might be grabbing the refined carbohydrates and the sugary foods. We're getting a, a fix for that burst of energy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at postpartum health, we want to, again, it's balancing your blood sugar levels. So it's having protein with every meal or snack, favoring your complex carbohydrates. So these are your brown and fibrous food, brown rice, brown pasta, sweet potatoes, butternut squash. Those are the ones that are going to help us with energy production. And then getting in enough of your veggies in as well. So um, 
Again, if you're craving chocolate, try and keep it to the 20% and um, ensure as well that you're getting enough liquid in, so enough of your water in, because that can really help with energy production as well. So was the question particularly about energy? Yeah, I've just it was about what's a good diet mm. when recovering after childbirth. But Rosie also wants to know, um, she, could, she says she's had recurring endometriosis mm. throughout her life. Is there anything she can change or improve on in her diet to help with that? So again, endometriosis affects so many of us. And um, with endometriosis, what we're understanding more and more is that it's an autoimmune condition as well. So therefore, we need to be looking after the immune system as well as the hormones and I feel that with hormonal imbalance we tend to just pick one hormone and, and stick with that one and try and do everything for that hormone but hormones work in synergy so you want to be looking at the whole picture and with uh, endometriosis for example you know there's a lot of links with possibly looking at reduction a lot in the um, research at the moment is that you know is all sugar just lumped together now sugar is sugar is sugar so if you're having refined sugar or if you're having these more natural sugars, they are going to have an impact on the body. However, if we're looking at what's going to be better for you, then you're better off having stuff like honey and maple syrup because they have trace elements of nutrients and even though it's trace elements, our body works in trace elements so therefore it becomes like a compounding effect so the, they all work together. Mm. However, if you're just replacing a whole lot of sugar for a whole lot of honey, you're having the opposite yeah. effect. Don't go crazy with the honey, mm. just because it's got trace elements. Yeah, uh, there's a mistake. Um, I'm wondering, what, what would be, if you had to give three foods that you would not touch with a barge pole, mm. what would they be? So, um, I steer clear of your hydrogenated and trans fats. So with the kind of fats in donuts? Yeah, the pies. deep fried foods, the... Um, the processed foods that are really fatty and um, the reason for that is that they they actually increase inflammation in the body and with hormones um, we want to, inflammation in the body is good so inflammation helps us heal but it should be like this little flickering candle mm -hmm. and at the moment what we've got is like raging bonfire mm -hmm. so what we need to do is dampen that and I'm not this is not talking about alkaline diets at all because the jury is still completely out about mm -hmm. that okay. so what I'm talking about is just bringing not giving your body uh, too many foods that can cause inflammation. Um, there's very few that I'd say you wouldn't touch with a barge pole, but if it's like a food-like product, these ultra-processed foods, ultra -processed. those are the ones that I'm steering clear of because there's so many other choices that I can make. Um, so that's that. And then these high fructose syrups and corn syrups, and there's just there are a lot of fizzy amounts. drinks, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So fizzy drinks, I mean, I like sparkling water, mm -hmm. um, but I don't touch... Uh, soda pops and things like that mm -hmm. at all. I used to I used to drink Diet Coke every single day, so diet sodas every single day, mm -hmm. um, and eight cups of coffee. So I'm also, for me personally, I don't do caffeine because it does not work well with me. I don't do caffeine either. It doesn't doesn't work well for my blood sugar. Um, in terms of happiness, eating to improve our moods mm. and and to sleep better, would that all be wrapped up with keeping a balanced blood sugar level? Do you know, well? I think that has to be our foundation, and that has to be the. Um, the w where we can all start from. So that could be the starting block for everyone because you know, when I work with a client, I go through a detailed health history and I can really pick out and help them to, to work what works for their body. And, and, but when we're looking at the foundation, it is the blood sugar balance, but mood, our serotonin, the majority is made in the gut. So red, Those gut bugs again. Yeah, so yeah. important to look after the gut. And then there's foods that can boost the mood. I've got um, a blog up on my website about that. And these foods are, are high in tryptophan, for example. So it could be something like turkey, um, avocado, as on rye bread. That could be like a nice mood-boosting food as well. And I mentioned, just going back to the fats, we mentioned earlier how it's good to eat fat mm. and fat won't make you fat. Um, as long as you in, know, moderation, in, in yeah. moderation, the good fats that you'd be talking about would be olive oils, avocado, nuts, those kind of oily fish, oily fish, um, olives, olive oil, those type of coconut foods. oil, coconut oil, and again, I think that we get into this. Okay, so fats good, coconut oil is good, and then we want to start eating it by the spoonfuls. But everything works in balance, so you don't want to have too much of any just one thing. Now, we are up on time, but can you stay for another five minutes? Because we've got so many questions, and I just want to... I can't believe we're up on time already. already. I know, I've got so fast. It's an area where everybody wants to know more about. Um, Eve just says, can you tell us what to do when we get old? How do our hormones change mm -hmm. after the age of 70? 
Okay, so first of all, 70, fantastic. Um, I love when I'm, I'm working with um, my older ladies, where I just think, you're 70, this is incredible. And the reason why I say that is because we still have hormones at that age. And we've gone, well, first of all, I feel just really grateful at every age that I get to and that, yeah. you know, and feeling healthy and compared to what I used to feel like to what I'm feeling like now. But when we're 70 and plus, we still have hormones. So um, again, it's eating the most nutrient rich foods 80% of the time. And by nutrient rich foods, it's not looking at, so we're looking at nutrients as opposed to calories and just making the best choice that you can with what's in front of you. So enough vegetables to help you poop. Colorful veg. Colorful veg. So really eating a rainbow, um, getting in those good fats and, and just enjoying life. So again, reducing stress, maybe doing long walks, uh, taking up some yoga, deep breathing is really important as well. Uh, we've covered loads. Oh, one more question about soy. Now, mm. I remember years and years ago uh, being told not to touch soy. Yeah. Because I, I actually grew up on soy milk because my sister had a dairy on me. So we, we had soy milk growing up. And then I remember hearing, oh my God, soy is awful. It's really bad for the thyroid. And, uh, and the estrogen is, is really yeah. bad if you're a child. And, and then all of a sudden it shifted again. It's like, no, no, soy is great now. Yeah. And so I'm confused. Where do yeah. you stand on soy? I tell you what, it is confusing. And it takes a lot to go through uh, all the literature and look at it because I mean I was confused as well and I was I completely fell into the processed soy trap as well so I was just like soy milk and soy yogurt and all of that mm. I would say if you with, with soy um, what we're looking at is it does have uh, it's called a phytoestrogen so it does have an estrogenic effect but it has a very mild effect mm. and um, without getting too technical here it, it actually docks onto your your healthier estrogen receptor sites, so that's your beta as opposed to the alpha. But you want to be having proper soy, so the fermented soy. So we're okay. looking at tempeh, we're looking at um, organically, non genetically modified soy. So you can have tofu, miso, and tempeh. Mm. Those are really, they can form part of a healthy, balanced diet. And if we look at the uh, Eastern cultures where they're eating a lot more soy, they, we, they eat it as a condiment as opposed to the main yeah. ingredient. And that's where I think we need to, to take, um, take advice from and, 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 and take, I forget, I can't think of the word I'm looking for now. Inspiration. Yeah. That's it. Take that and, and add it in as a condiment, not having it every day and going for the best quality you can have. So uh, now I've noticed that some supermarkets have started doing well, it's soya yogurt, so it's processed soy, but then they say it's fermented. And I think what they've done is added a bit of bifidus in there. Uh, Does that still count as a, as a processed oh, I, soy? You know, or? I haven't come across that, so I'm going to yeah. have to look into that. I can get That's back to you on that. Answer, but, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll get back to you on that All one. right, cool. And, uh, oh, wow, Facebookers, I'm so sorry that we haven't got through all of your questions. You are all stars putting down such thoughtful comments. Um, where can people find you if they want to hear more about you now? What's your website and where can they find you on Twitter and Facebook? So I am um, on all the places that you can find a person Good. these days. So I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, and I'm on Facebook. So Instagram is Angelique Panagos, and Facebook is Angelique Panagos Nutrition. So I've just decided to take different names everywhere. And um, my website is angeliquepanagos.com. Um, so I hope that if you do have more questions, get in touch, come join my health tribe, and um, I hope this has been really helpful. Well, I've loved it, and, um, and I know you guys will too. Thanks for joining us, Thank and if you, you like this, hit the like button on my page, then you'll get notified when we go live with the next one, or subscribe to Health Hackers on iTunes. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.